Hello all. This next online lecture is brought to you by Suomen Sotahistorinen Seura, uh, that is the Association for Military History in Finland. I have the great pleasure to introduce our guest lecturer from Berlin, Germany, Professor Dr. Winfried Heinemann. He is a former member of the Center of Military History and Social Sciences in Potsdam. His last post there was Colonel and Chief of Staff. Now he is an honorary professor at the Brandenburg University of Technology in Cottbus. Professor Heinemann will talk about a well-known German military leader, Eduard Dietl, who was respected and trusted by his own superiors and subordinates and by the Finns who were his brothers in arms during the Second World War. Dietl also had a good reputation among the civilian population of Finnish Lapland where he was stationed. Currently, Professor Heinemann is writing a biography of Dietl. The topic of his lecture is General Oberst Dietl, Hitler's paladin, hero of Narvik, commander-in-chief in Finland. Without further ado, Professor Heinemann, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been invited to speak about General Dietl, who fought in Finland. But let me start by saying that I will refer several times to another German officer, General Feldmarschall Erwin Rommel, who, as you all know, fought in Africa and later in France. And let me explain first why I believe this occasional comparison may be useful. Rommel and Dietl were similar in many ways. First and most importantly, both conformed to Hitler's idea of the ideal German officer. There were no Prussians, but rather South Germans, Dietl from Bavaria, Rommel from Swabia. Both were infantry officers, so not from those artillery types like Keitel, Jodl, Beck, Fritschow, Rommel, who had dominated the later Reichswehr years. Neither of them had attended General Staff College. General Staff officers was another case that Hitler intensely disliked as they tended to come up with facts and figures where the Führer believed in willpower and fanatical determination. And also Hitler felt insecure with officers from the classical families of the Prussian nobility, and both Rommel and Dietl were from middle-class families. My interest in this topic stems from my long-standing plan as we have heard, to write a detailed biography. Now, admittedly, there are at least two of them, one by the former librarian of the Bundeswehr Mountain Division, Ronald Kaltenegger, and the other by a really revisionist writer, Fritz Gorowski, um, both apologetic of the Wehrmacht. However, there is no scholarly biography yet, and while there are a few academic German histories of Narvik and uh, Operation Weserübung, the German occupation of Norway in 1940, the account of the war in Finland from 1941 to 44 in German in general and in the large serious Germany and the Second World War is rather sketchy. Eduard Dietl was a child of the mountains. In the Allgäu, the German South in the Alps, he is remembered for his command of the mountain forces in late Narvik and later in Finland. But the future Colonel General was also among those who paved the way for National Socialism, which he never renounced until his death. Eduard Dietl was born in the Bavarian town of Eibling in 1890, so a year younger than Hitler. He was the son of a tax inspector. In 1909, he joined the 5th Royal Bavarian Infantry Regiment as an officer cadet, and in 1911, he became a lieutenant. During the First World War, he lost two brothers. He himself fought at the Western Front, and he was wounded several times. As a consequence, his personality was shaped by the same image of war as that was uh, to fight a Hitler. Positional trench warfare, in which officers had to overcome the classical distinctions between officers and men to some degree if they wanted to keep their men motivated and disciplined. By the way, while Dietl's and Hitler's divisions fought alongside each other for a while, 
there is no foundation in the sources to the speculation that Roland Kaltenegger offers in his book, namely that the infantry officer and the corporal had come to know each other already then. And just for your background, Rommel fought in the mountains, first in the eastern, on the Eastern Front, and then in the Alps. And he actually earned Pour le Merit, or a dash, dashing Stoßtrupp push in the Alps. There he is with his Blue Max, as Americans would say. Titel, fighting in the trenches, won an Iron Cross, first class, which is not nearly the same thing. But Dietl learned to be a good leader of men, even if he was no brilliant tactician. When the war ended and Dietl's regiment had been disbanded, in April 1919, Dietl joined the Freikorps Epp. We see it here on the screen. With this unit of Bavarian volunteers, he took part in the crushing of the Munich Soviet Republic. However, Although that was a very brutal affair in general, we do not know about any war crimes or any crimes at all that Dietl may have committed at that time. It was at about the same time, early summer 1919, that the Gefreiter Hitler also took his first step into politics as what was called an education officer in the Reichswehr. Again, it's not true that it was Captain Dietl who recommended Hitler for this post. But what we do know is that Hitler did in fact speak in front of Dietl's company. In his eulogy for Dietl, Hitler stated on 1st of July, 1944, quote, he was the first officer of the German Wehrmacht who made his unit available to me so I could exert political influence. One hour after I had talked to the third company of his regiment, this man shook my hand and explained that from this moment on, he would be my follower and supporter. Okay, this does not make Dietl the man who helped Hitler come to power in the sense of that he gained global importance in history. It was not Dietl who made it possible for Hitler to enter politics. And we know that from the source, it, it was a Captain Karl Mayer of the Reichswehrgruppenkommando 4. Nevertheless, the meeting resulted in Dietl becoming a member of the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei as early as 1919, later to be the Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or if you will, the Nazi party. We don't know exactly why he did, but what his earlier political influences might have been. He did not join before Hitler either. The oldest register of members lists Dietl at number 524 and Hitler as number 555. But that doesn't mean anything because the sequence is due to the fact that the list is organized alphabetically. By the way, it doesn't mean it was such a big party. Uh, the list starts with number 501. But it means that Dietl was among the first 160 members of the future Nazi party. In the course of 1920, he left the party again, probably because as an active officer, he was not allowed to be a party member. Where the Freikorps Epp didn't really bother with anyone being in the Nazi party. They were not restrictive about that at all because the Freikorps Epp itself saw, the Freikorps Epp itself saw itself as national and rather apolitical. When the Freikorps was integrated into the Reichswehr, however, and that was in 1920, Dietl must have been obliged to give up party political ties, and it became the law in 1921 anyway. So Dietl was sworn in to defend the Weimar Constitution, the Democratic Republican Constitution, but it, that did not mean that he had in any way abandoned the extreme right-wing worldview. On the contrary, in the early stages of the Weimar Republic, there was almost no movement on the political right in which Dietl had no part, at least if it was in the south of Germany. He was supposed to play a major role in the Kapputsch in Munich, which, however, collapsed before he could reach the south, and he was supposed to command a designated officer's block. So since the coup failed, Dietl never really came into 
things changed after the French occupation of the Rhineland in 1923. The Reichswehr command prepared for a rapid reinforcement of the army, which by then had been limited to 100,000 troops. And the first consideration was for what was known as the, the Wehrverbände or Vaterländische Verbände, the patriotic organizations, in other words, the political right. Beatles Regiment, Infantry Regiment 19 in Munich, was intended to rapidly set up another two battalions using these patriotic associations. And the first company of the regiment commanded by Dietl was to form a battalion together with two companies of the Hermannsbund and an, another company consisting of the Nationalsozialisten or what was called the Storm, Stormtroopers. To prepare for this, his Reichswehr superiors had appointed Dietl as a military instructor of the Munich SA from spring 1923. And in the SA, he had found like-minded fellow soldiers and friends. So when Hitler and General Ludendorff staged a coup d'etat on 8 and 9 November 1923, it cannot surprise us that Dietl's heart was with the Putschists rather than the Republic. Dietl was not involved in the preparations for the Putsch, but he was among the agitators when Bavarian Reichswehr officers came together for a meeting on 8 November. And he voiced his opinion that, quote, the youth had waited long enough and now it was finally time. So Dietl appeared in his barracks. Basically, the idea had been to conduct night training for the SA and the Hammondsbund, and that had been planned a long time ago. But shortly before 10 p.m., information about the putsch was received. Dietl approved of the measures that were already in place and did not assist in arming the SA. But at the same time, there was the question whether the Reichswehr, that would mean his battalion, would be used against the putsch and in defense of the constitution. There, Dietl was not ready to act. Together with three lieutenants, he reported to his superior officer that they could demand anything of him but, quote, to fire at his excellency Ludendorff, this is what I personally am not able to do, end of quote. Actually, it's interesting to note that at least in this quotation from his defense after the event, Dietl referred to Ludendorff rather than Hitler. You can see Ludendorff in the center and Hitler to the right. Dietl's refusal to protect the Republic in its hour of need became known in the city soon enough and was brought before a committee of inquiry chaired by Lieutenant Colonel and future General Field Marshal Wilhelm List. The committee's task was defined as to, quote, dispel the rumors against Captain Dietl. And being good soldiers, that is exactly what they did. They dispelled the rumors. The committee found that since there had been no operations order at the time in question, Dietl could not be accused of disobedience. He thus narrowly, really narrowly escaped dismissal from the Reichswehr, but he was transferred to the order of training area in the middle of nowhere for disciplinary reasons. Dietl was not among the inner circle around Hitler. He is not mentioned in Hitler's early notes. After the failed putsch, Dietl never visited the Führer in prison, nor did he actively engage in politics. Hitler later stated that Dietl had been, quote, a midwife at the birth of the Third Reich, is certainly an ex exaggeration. But he did get, and we will hear about that again later, the Golden Party Badge, 20 years later in November 1943. Dietl went on and had an unassuming career like many other Reichswehr officers. He served first as a company commander, then in staff functions, but always in his beloved 19th Bavarian Infantry Regiment in Munich. He never served in any higher commands in the war ministry. Then in 1931, 
he assumed command of the mountain battalion of his regiment, also in Munich. And he left it only in 1934 to become commander of a newly created infantry regiment in Hamburg, still in Bavaria, later in Regensburg. You see, he is still in Bavaria in the south of Germany. And it must have seemed to him the highlight of his career when in 1935, he was entrusted with the Wehrmacht 1st Mountain Regiment, Gebirgsjäger Regiment 99, then based in Kempten, and relocated to Füssen a year later, where a new barracks had been built for it. For it. Head of its troops, Colonel Dietl paraded through the new town into the new barracks. Now, without the growth of the Wehrmacht during the years from 33 to 39, Dietl would probably have been discharged into retirement as a well-respected, largely insignificant regimental commander. But as it was, Dietl left Füssen again in May 1938 and took over command of the 3rd Mountain Division in Graz, which had been Austrian and had just then been annexed by the German Reich. And out of the formerly Austrian army elements, Dietl was to form the 3rd Mountain Division, and for that he had been promoted Major General on 1st of April 1938. During the crisis days of September 1938, Dietl's division was deployed into an area between the Semmering Pass and Wiener Neustadt, that is on the northeastern side of the Alps, ready to attack into Czechoslovakia. But in due course, once the Prague government had been forced to accept the Munich Agreement and cede the Sudeten border region, Dietl's 3rd Mountain Division was one of those units which crossed the border took control of the newly acquired territories, but eventually returned to Austria to perfect their alpine winter training. Not everything Dietl did in the peace years of the Third Reich was typical for a National Socialist. For instance, he placed the son of an old friend in his regiment, although he was one quarter of Jewish descent. But nevertheless, within the officer corps, Dietl was known as a Nazi. So, in a way, we can refer to him as the archetypal good Nazi, not personally intent on harming anyone, but a true believer in Hitler's greatness. With his division, Dietl went to war, the Second World War, in September 1939. And during the campaign against Poland, the Third Mountain Division was part of the 18th Mountain Corps, which formed the extreme right wing of the push into southern Poland from Silesia. There are indications that soldiers of the division shot Polish civilians suspected of irregular warfare. But the sources also indicate that, for example, looting was punished by courts martial. Altogether, Dieter has never been accused of any personal responsibility for war crimes during this period. All this would have been run of the mill and not worth mentioning. Dieter's really big moment came when the German Reich reached for Denmark and Norway in April. 1940. Now, originally, the second mountain division had been intended for the most difficult subtask of the entire operation, the occupation of the iron ore port of Narvik. Hitler himself intervened and made sure the job went to Dietl's third mountain division under the command of his old friend who had by then been promoted lieutenant general. Now, the occupation of Narvik as such went more or less smoothly for the German army, but the Kriegsmarine suffered really major losses, losing 10 out of the 20 destroyers it had at the beginning of the operation. The only major crisis occurred in Narvik when British and French troops landed and made an attempt at reconquering the strategically important port against the resistance put up by Dietl's rather motley forces of mountaineer troops and Navy soldiers. Mm -hmm. 
you see the German destroyers burn here in Narvik Fjord at night. What was facing Tietl was a scenario not unlike the trench warfare of 1914 to 18. Hold on to every meter of ground, do not give him anything, do not despair, no matter how desperate the situation may seem. And that is where Dietl's abilities came into their own. There was no tactical finesse called for, but personal example and excellent leadership. And that is how Dietl successfully motivated his soldiers to persevere, even when Hitler himself had almost abandoned the, the whole thing and had given Dietl carte blanche to cross with his troops into neutral Sweden and have themselves in turn. In the end, the German units probably could not have succeeded against the British and French forces, especially since the Royal Navy had cut off the sea route to the Reich and the supply situation became increasingly desperate. However, as the situation in France worsened after the German attack of May 1940, the Western Allies saw themselves forced to withdraw their troops from Narvik. Dietl's troops woke up one morning and, to their own surprise, found the enemy gone. Dietl's calls for holding on at all costs had won the day. On 9th of May 1940, he was awarded the Knight's Cross. He also rose in the hierarchy. The former divisional commander was now given command of an entire army corps. Mountain Corps, Norway. And that warranted another promotion again. So on 19th July 1940, Hitler made him a three star general, the infantry, an infantry general, in consideration of his great service, was the official quotation. And Hitler also awarded him the oak leaves to the Knights Trust, and he was actually the first officer of the Wehrmacht to receive this award. The second being Erwin Rommel, whose Seventh Panzer Division had conducted a lightning campaign in France, not unlike Rommel's daring exploit in the Dolomites in the First World War. This brings us to the autumn of 1940 when Hitler began to plan for a German attack on the Soviet Union. And that brought up the question of possible German-Finnish cooperation. In the high north, German interests fo focused on securing the then Finnish nickel mines in the Petsamo region, as 60% of their pro production actually went to Germany. Hitler's core was tasked first with protecting the Petsamo region against the Red Army attack, initially purely defensive plan which had been prepared since the summer of 1940. However, in all this he was subordinate to Army Oberkommando Norwegen, the army level commander in Norway, General Oberst von Falkenhorst. And Falkenhorst's staff had more far-reaching plans. Hitler had prohibited all German commanders from revealing such plans for an attack on the Soviet Union, even to potential allies like the Finns, so that even without consulting with the Finnish high command, the Armee Oberkommando Norwegen began to plan for a breakthrough to the shores of the White Sea, effectively disrupting the strategic link between Murmansk and the Soviet main. The code name was Silver Fox. And it was to happen in three stages. First, in the north, Operation Reindeer would mean that Dietl's Corps with the second and third mountain divisions was to secure Petsamo. Following that, in Operation Platinum Fox, it would attack from there towards Murmansk, while the 36th Army Corps and the Finnish General Halma Tsilaswo would push further south toward Kandalaksha, Operation Tick Fox. And this marked the change from a defensive posture, securing Petsamo and its vital strategic resources, to an offensive stance with a strategic aim, namely disrupting the links between uh, the sea and the Soviet main. As many of you will know, Field Marshal Mannheim had regularly entered 
into a regular alliance with Germany, nor had he permitted German troops in major strength onto Finnish territory before war broke out between Finland and the Soviet Union. As a result, when the German Wehrmacht attacked the Soviet Union on 22nd of June 1941, Dietl's Corps made its first moves onto Finnish ground and could initiate its attack against the Soviet fortifications east of Petsamo only a week later on 29 June 1941. As I mentioned, the operation also included the Third Finnish Corps commanded by Major General Silas. All three corps were controlled by the Befehlstelle Finland of the Army High Command Norway, or in case of the Finnish troops, let's better say, coordinated. Personal relations between Falkenhorst and Dietl seemed to have been frayed. Falkenhorst resented the way Dietl had been created a hero by Hitler and the Nazi propaganda for successes achieved under his, Falkenhorst's, command. Initially, the attack east seemed to go well. German troops in the extreme north broke through the Soviet positions. Further south, however, the terrain did not allow for any large-scale movements, and the Germans had not realized that. Even if there was little enemy resistance, it was difficult to push forward. Eventually, Dietl's corps managed to cross the Litza River in one place, but had to withdraw soon enough to the west side again under pressure of a Soviet counterattack. Starting in September 1941, the campaign bogged down into the kind of position of warfare Dietl knew all too well from the First World War. Murmansk was never taken. The Murman Railway was never cut. The link via Murmansk remained one of the strategic supply links from the US and Britain to the Soviet Union. In early 1942, Hitler deemed the time had come to divide the German command structure in Scandinavia. Leaving Falkenhorst to prepare a possible defense of Norway, the Befehlstelle Finland was converted into Armee Oberkommando Lippland in early 1942, and then again into Oberkommando 20th Mountain Army in June 1942. And of course, it was Dietl who was given command of the new army, which earned him his last promotion to General Oberst of Four Star in June 1942. Also, Norway had been under the control of the Wehrmacht High Command. Dietl's new command was concerned exclusively with fighting against the Soviets, so he now reported to Army High Command directly, without any army group commander-in-chief in the middle, which meant that when Hitler took control of the army himself, Hitler came direct, uh, Dietl came directly under Hitler. Dietl's task was to continue attacking towards Murmansk, or failing that, to push in the general direction of Soroka, Yelomorsk, on the White Sea further south. That again would have been the task of the Third Finnish Corps under General Silasvo. But under US political pressure, Finnish interests in supporting operations up in the high north seemed to have waned. When Dietl paid his first official visit to Marshal Mannerheim, the Finnish commander-in-chief made his reluctance pretty clear. And even a visit by Hitler himself on the occasion of Mannerheim's 75th birthday in June 1942 did not change that attitude. In this static warfare, Dietl adopted specific measures to successfully avoid permanent damage to morale. His strength lay, as I have said before, in direct leadership and human interaction. Let me just quote one eyewitness. I never heard a single word of discontent with General Dietl from the people I spoke to. On the contrary, everyone only spoke with great respect, warm admiration, and deep gratitude for the exemplary care he provided with his personal commitment. End of quote, this eyewitness. His strength, however, also hid a weakness. While Dietl was talented in his dealings with people, his operational abilities were obviously limited. 
Although throughout 1942, 1942-44, he succeeded in preventing a decisive Soviet success in northern Finland, he never achieved the strategic objective of cutting off Murmansk. Okay, that was also due to the fact that the Army High Command created its point of main effort elsewhere and detailing to the flanks only the barest minimum of forces. What is striking is that despite his long acquaintance with Hitler, Dietl never reached the rank of General Feldmarschall, which Rommel obtained after conquering Tunis. Dietl just lacked that one triumphal victory, which might have provided the occasion. It is also possible that such a promotion might have interfered with the relations with the Finnish president, Marshal Mannerheim. The main reason why Dietl did not experience this crowning moment of his career was probably that even well-meaning fellow soldiers were critical of his abilities as Supreme Commander. Quote, he certainly was not a brilliant strategist, as the myth exaggerated at the time, end of quote. Or worse still, an Austrian general of noble descent and with political savvy referred to Dietl as tantalizingly dumb. For Hitler himself, it was Dietl's loyalty and popularity that was first and foremost in his mind, just as it was in the case of Rommel. So Hitler remarked once that for him, quote, Rommel's abilities were, of course, without a shadow of doubt, end of quote. And that is a comment that Hitler never made about Dietl, to whom he was personally closer. Dietl was of particular importance to National Socialist propaganda, as he was considered down to earth and even affable. In this case, too, a comparison with Rommel is helpful. Rommel was arrogant, vain, and haughty. Rommel was feared. Dietl was beloved by many. In the autumn of 1943, Morale in Germany was low after Stalingrad, after the surrender in Tunis, after the first 1,000 bomber raids against German cities, and eventually the collapse of the U-boat war. Dietl was summoned into the Reich to give a number of public speeches in Bavaria and Austria. The old mountaineers' addresses met the expectations in full. The squares in Munich, Rosenheim, Ingolstadt, Graz, wherever he went, were filled with thousands of people you see him here in Munich. Needle was no orator. He just spoke about the heroic combat of his infantrymen, the Jäger in the Arctic, and called on the people to persevere. Quote, we accept the war as an instrument of a reasonable fate, and I believe in the Führer. The more difficult the situation, the more I trust him. And it was certainly no coincidence that in November 1943, Dietl spoke in front of the Munich Feldjahnhalle, exactly 20 years after the 1923 putsch in the same place. Especially since the party propaganda had greatly exaggerated Dietl's role in that event. It has been observed that in the final phase of the war, the old comrades who had fought alongside Hitler in the 1920s came into their own again, after having fallen into oblivion before. And nobody who had heard Dietl speak could have any doubt here was a leading and popular general unconditionally shared the objectives of the old National Socialists and whose loyalty to the Führer knew no limits. And that is exactly when Hitler awarded Dietl the Golden Party Badge. The theater of war in the far north was largely devoid of population, so that there were no Wehrmacht excesses against the civilian population as there had been in Belarusia or Ukraine. But we do know that the order to two political commissars of the Red Army had been followed in Finland as well, but with no firm figures for Dietl's corps. By 1944, the development of the military situation in Finland gave rise to concern in Berlin. In view of the Soviet successes, there was a fear that the Finnish semi-ally would withdraw from the war. 
And the Finnish government might even try to buy Soviet goodwill by allowing the Soviet army to advance through southern Finland, separating the German forces fighting there from their rear connections across the Baltic. In that case, Sweden would most likely also be unwilling to allow the German units through their country. Therefore, it seemed opportune to improve the retreat routes through northern Norway to make them passable in winter and to protect them against attack from the sea. The map shows the actual retreat in September 1944. By that time, uh, Dietl was dead, but it gives the basic idea of how the retreat was beginning to be planned in the winter of 1943-44. Hitler ordered such preparations for retreat to be made on 28 September 1943. It was actually against Dietl's express recommendation because Dietl was concerned that it might send the wrong signal to the Finnish ally. But construction works on the roads in northern Finland and on Highway 50, which ran from the North Cape along the Norwegian coast to the south, began as early as autumn 43. And the manpower? Prisoners from the Imsland Lager camps of the Justice Administration and from the German military prison in Torgau were used for this work. That is, people who had been sentenced to prison for various offenses and were considered unworthy of military service. That included deserters, conscientious objectors, or political prisoners. As they arrived in Rovaniemi, where Dietl's headquarters were located, the famous general gave them a pep speech, very different from the ones delivered back home. They would be marched northwards, he told them, along the Arctic Ocean Highway, over several hundred kilometers. And Dietl said, who doesn't tag along will be shot. And indeed, many of the poor men never reached their destinations. Their guards, probably encouraged by the great man's words, caught anyone dead who could not keep up. The extremely harsh living conditions, poor supply, and sometimes inhuman treatment caused the death of many more prisoners. Despite massive use of organization taught prisoners and troops, the improvement of March routes started in full only in the early summer of 1944. Just in brackets, although this was harsh and cruel, in a strict sense it was no war crime. War crimes can only be committed against enemy personnel or assets. Really, the differentiation is specious. There is another indication that Dietl was more firmly attached to the National Socialist worldview than many other generals. And this is evident in a directive on marriage between German soldiers and Norwegian or Finnish women signed by him. In December 1942, he issued, quote, a very serious warning to the superiors of all ranks in which he generally objected to such marriages. Quote, with very few exceptions, the applications submitted refer to rather inferior female representatives of neighboring peoples and to, quote, racial driftwood. Now, the Norwegians and Finns were, of course, Aryans, according to Nazi ideology. But for Dietl, they were not sufficiently familiar with German culture and would therefore be unable to be good German mothers. They would not be able to sing their kids German good night songs or read German fairy tales to them, Beatle wrote. And the Wehrmacht High Command considered such an attitude a good example and distributed the directive to all other supreme commanders of army for instruction. Eisführer SS Heinrich Himmler was the only one who did not agree with such racist rigorism. And he complained about the extremely negative impact of this order. For Himmler, it was important to recruit volunteers for his Waffen SS from the what he called Nordic peoples. And this did not seem possible if the sisters of future SS soldiers were disqualified as racial driftwood. The Wehrmacht High Command to reach it. Let me come to Dietl's death. Field Marshal Mannerheim, most Finnish leaders, trusted Dietl as a plain-spoken, competent, and honest interlocutor. 
although he wasn't really the political liaison officer for that, Hitler had appointed someone else, General Walter Erfurt. Dietl was the man. And in the summer of 1944, German fears resurfaced that Finland might agree on a separate peace with the Soviet Union. On 22 June, Dietl reported to Hitler on the Obersalzberg and discussed possibilities to increase support for the Finns and prevent their withdrawal from the war. An evacuation of Finland was not considered. The following day, Dietl was to fly back to Finland, but his plane crashed in an alpine pass in bad weather. There were two survivors and Dietl was not one of them. The hero of Narvik was dead. Hitler did not want to burden the ongoing negotiations with the Finnish and gave orders to keep Dietl's death a secret for a week. Soon, this gave rise to rumors that the plane crash might not have been an accident after all. Hitler immediately called for an air accident investigation since he feared it might have been an act of Allied sabotage to interfere with the German Finnish alliance. In the course of the investigation, however, it became apparent that the crash had indeed been an accident. And here is where Dietl's two biographers, apologetic and hagiographic as they both are, profoundly disagree. Not that one of them would believe Dietl's death was a simple air crash. Both are agreed that it was foul play. But who was to blame? Kurevsky conjectures that Hitler may have had Dietl eliminated because of the general's criticism. Upon closer analysis, this turns out to be insupportable. The day before, Dietl had bluntly reported to the Führer about the military situation in Finland. But there is absolutely no indication of any kind of rift. On the contrary, Hitler is supposed to have told his environment once Dietl had left that here was at least one officer who did not beat about the bush. Dietl's death caught Hitler by surprise, that we know for a fact, and Dietl was one of the few fun funerals Hitler actually attended. Let us compare again for a moment with Rommel. The murder of the much more famous Field Marshal Rommel only a few months later shows that the regime was able to prepare the elimination of popular army commanders much, much more thoroughly than this. Dietl's other biographer, Kaltenegger, wants us to believe that the German resistance movement had tried to recruit Dietl, the old Nazi had declined, and therefore the, res the resistance movement had him killed so that he could not betray the plot. That, of course, is also nonsense. It leaves unanswered the question why Dietl's so-called murder would have taken place when the general returned from the Führer's headquarters to the front and not before Dietl meeting with him. Above all, it does not answer the question of why members of the resistance should have approached one of the most prominent national socialists among German generals for assistance. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a specialist for the German military resistance, and without going into more detail, there's nothing in this. Dietl's death was an accident. When it was officially announced, the Wehrmacht order of the day read, quote, as a fanatic national socialist, Colonel General Dietl had been deeply committed to the greater German Reich in steadfast loyalty and fervent belief. Hitler did actually go to the funeral and did give the speech. And he stated he had lost, quote, a valuable and loyal friend who had been a national socialist, not only in words, but according to his will and his heart. One last comparison with Rommel. Rommel was one of the few generals who actually understood at the end of their career that this war had to come to an end, that it was a criminal war. Rommel put an ultimatum to Hitler, and that is why Hitler had him killed. That is something Dietl would never have done. Let me end by a few remarks about Dietl and the Bundeswehr. When in 1955, the post-war West German state began to rearm, the question soon came, which military traditions and army in a Western-oriented liberal democracy should honor? You can put the problem into other words. Many of the older soldiers felt they were valuable to the new military because of their experience in fighting the Soviets, while at the same time, the Federal Republic desperately hoped 
to distance itself from the Nazi state and its military, the Wehrmacht. One, asset, one facet was more specifically barracks had to be reused and new ones had to be built to accommodate the Bundeswehr units not being formed. One of the barracks to be reused would be the one in Füssen, which Dietl had been the first commanding officer in. What was more, it would again accommodate mountain troops. It was more natural than that soon there would be calls to name barracks after the late General Oberst. The Federal Minister of Defense, the Bavarian Franz Josef Strauss, was released. The first series of newly built barracks opened during his term in office all received names of men associated with the resistance, General Obersbeck, General Major Henning von Tresco, Graf Stauffenberg, and so on. Naming the Füssen barracks after Dietl would not sit well with this. So Klaus actually never allowed the proposed renaming to go ahead. The Dietl barracks came into being only under his successor, the far more national conservative Kai Uwe von Hassel. In May 1964, he approved the proposed new name, and the barracks in Füssen were henceforth known as General Dietl-Kaserne. And it was only in the late 1980s that this name was put into question. It all started in Bad Aibling, where Dietl had been born, and where a street bore his name. The campaign called for renaming the street as Dietl was not worthy of an honorable memory. Well, from there, the calls to replace Dietl as a patron of streets, places, and so on spread all over Bavaria, and it involved the Fussen Barretts, as well as other Second World War generals as name givers as well. For a long time, the Bundeswehr fought a delaying action. It was only in November 1995 that the then Minister of Defense decided to rename the Dietl Barretts. If you look carefully, they are now known as the Algoi Barracks. I feel that the debate about Dietl is a good litmus test for our attitude to military tradition. As we said before, Dietl was the archetype of a good Nazi, the gifted leader of men with no or almost no war crimes. Why should he not be held up to young German conscripts as a good example? On the other hand, we have the man who had sworn to defend the democratic constitution and who refused to do so when called upon. Well, you may argue we all make mistakes in our youth, but Dietl was not one to make mistakes, which he would later regret. He proudly wore the Golden Party badge, which he received for his role in 1920. He was a Nazi, he revered Hitler, and he never wavered in his loyalty to the party. So what is it that counts for us in our military tradition? Military prowess or political reliability in the service of a democratic country? Can we call on our young soldiers to defend democratic values and at the same time confront them with heroes who stood for a thoroughly undemocratic criminal system? In other words, what do we want our soldiers to stand for today? Thank you. Professor Heinemann, thank you very much for your informative, nicely illustrated and compelling lecture. It certainly contained a lot of new information. And thank you all for watching this video. Bye bye. Thank you very much for your informative, nicely illustrated and compelling lecture. It certainly contained a lot of new information. And thank you all for watching this video. Bye bye.